Chapter 7 They don't wait long to retaliate. For the rest of the afternoon and early evening, we receive lessons in history. A cat-headed goblin named Yero recites ballads and asks us questions. The more correct answers I give, the angrier Cardam grows. He makes no secret of his displeasure, drawling to Locke about how boring these lessons are and sneering at the lecturer. For once, we're done before dark has fully fallen. Taryn and I start for home, with her giving me concerned glances. The light of sunset filters through the trees, and I take a deep breath, drinking in the scents of pine needles. I feel a kind of weird calm, despite the stupidity of what I've done. This isn't like you, Taryn finally says. You don't pick fights with people. Appeasing them won't help. I toe a stone with my booted foot. The more they get away with, the more they believe they're entitled to have. So you're going to what? Teach them manners? Taryn sighs. Even if someone should do it, that doesn't mean it has to be you. She's right. I know she's right. The giddy fury of the afternoon will fade, and I will regret what I have done. Probably after a good long sleep. I'll be as horrified as Taryn is. All I have bought myself is worse problems, no matter how good it felt to solve my pride. You're no killer. What you lack is nothing to do with experience. And yet, I don't regret it now. Having stepped off the edge, what I want to do is fall. I begin to speak when a hand clamps down over my mouth. Fingers sink into the skin around my lips. I strike out, swinging my body around, and see Locke grabbing Taryn's waist. Someone has my wrists. I wrench my mouth free and scream, but screams in fairy are like birdsong, too common to attract much attention. They push us through the woods, laughing. I hear a whoop from one of the boys. I think I hear Locke say something about larks being over quickly, but it's swallowed up in the merriment. Then a shove at my shoulder and the horrible shock of cold water closing over me. I sputter, trying to breathe. I taste mud and reeds. I shove myself up. Taryn and I are waist high in the river, the current pushing us downstream towards deeper, rougher parts. I dig my feet into the mud at the bottom to keep from being swept away. Taryn is gripping a boulder. Her hair is wet. She must have slipped. There are Nixies in this river, Valerian says. If you don't get out before they find you, they'll put you under and hold you there. Their sharp teeth will sink into your skin, he mimes, taking a bite. They're all along the riverbank, Cardin closest, Valerian beside him. Locke brushes his hand over the tops of cattails and bulrushes, looking abstracted. He does not seem kind now. He seems bored with his friends, and with us, too. Nixies can't help what they are, Nikasia says, kicking the water so that it splashes my face. Just like you won't be able to help drowning. I dig my feet deeper into the mud. The water filling my boots makes it hard to move my legs, but the mud locks them in place when I manage to stand still. I don't know how I am going to get Taran without slipping. Valerian is emptying out our school bags onto the riverbank. He and Nikasia and Locke take turns hurling the contents into the water. My leather-bound notebooks, rolls of paper that disintegrate as they sink. The books of ballads and histories make an enormous splash, then lodge between two stones and will not budge. My fine pen and nibs shimmer along the bottom. My ink pot shatters on the rocks, turning the river vermilion. Cardin watches me. Although he doesn't lift a finger, I know this is all his doing. In his eyes, I see the vast alienness of fairy. Is this fun? I call to the shore. I am so furious that there is no room for being scared. Are you enjoying yourselves? Enormously, says Cardin. Then his gaze slides from me to where the shadows rest under the water. Are those Nixies? I cannot tell. I just keep moving towards Terran. This is just a game, Nikasia says. But sometimes we play too hard with our toys, and then they break. It's not like we drowned you ourselves, Valerian calls. My foot slips on slick rocks, and I am under, swept downstream, helplessly gulping muddy water. I panic, snorting it into my lungs. I thrust out a hand, and it closes on the root of a tree. I get my balance again, grasping and coughing. Nikasia and Valerian are laughing. Locke's expression is unreadable. Cardin has one foot in the reeds, as though to get a better look. Furious and sputtering, I push my way back to Terran, who comes forward to grab my hand and squeeze it hard. I thought you were going to drown, she says, 
the edge of hysteria in her voice. We're fine, I tell her. Digging my feet into the murk, I reach down to find a rock. I find a large one and heft it up, green and slick with algae. If the Nixies come at us, I'll hold them off. Quit, Cardin says. He's looking directly at me. He does not even spare a glance for Terran. You should have never been tutored with us. Abandon thoughts of the tourney. Tell Maddox you don't belong with us. Your betters. Do that and I'll save you. I stare at him. All you have to do is give in, he says. Easy. I look over at my sister. It's my fault she's wet and scared. The river is cold, despite the heat of summer, the current strong. And you'll save Terran too? Oh, so you'll do what I say for her sake? Cardin's gaze is hungry, devouring. Does that feel noble? He pauses, and in that silence, all I hear is Terran's hitched breath. Well, does it? I look at the Nixies, watch them for any sign of movement. Why don't you tell me how you want me to feel? Interesting. He takes another step closer, squatting and regarding us from eye level. There are so few children in fairy that I have never seen one of us twinned. Is it like being doubled or more like being divided in half? I don't answer. Behind him, I see Nikasia thread her arm through locks and whisper something to him. He gives her a scathing look, and she pouts. Maybe they're annoyed that we're not currently being eaten. Cardin frowns. Twin sister, he says, turning to Taryn. A smile returns to his mouth as though a terrible new idea has come to delight him. Would you make a similar sacrifice? Let's find out. I have a most generous offer for you. Climb up the bank and kiss me on both of my cheeks. Once that's done, so long as you don't defend your sister by word or deed, I won't hold you accountable for her defiance. Now, isn't that a good bargain? But you only get it if you come with us now and leave her there to drown. Show her that she will always be alone. For a moment, Taryn stands still, as if frozen. Go, I say. I'll be fine. It still hurts when she wades towards the bank, but of course, she should go. She will be safe, and the price is nothing that matters. One of the pale shapes detaches from the others and swims towards her, but my shadow in the water makes it hesitate. I mime throwing the rock, and it jolts a little. They like easy prey. Valerian takes Terran's hand and helps her out of the water as if she were a great lady. Her dress is soaked, dripping as she moves, like the dresses of water sprites or sea nymphs. She presses her bluish lips to Cardin's cheeks, one and then the other. She keeps her eyes closed, but his are open, watching me. Say, I forsake my sister Jude, Nikasia tells her. I won't help her. I don't even like her. Taryn looks in my direction, quick and apologetic. I don't have to say that. That wasn't part of the bargain. The others laugh. Cardin's boot parts the thickets and bulrushes. Locke starts to speak, but Cardin cuts him off. Your sister abandoned you. See what we can do with a few words, and everything can get so much worse. We can enchant you to run on all fours, barking like a dog. We can curse you to wither away for want of a song you'll never hear again, or a kind word from my lips. We're not mortal. We will break you. You're a fragile little thing. We hardly need to try. Give up. Never, I say. He smiles. Never. Never is like forever. Too big for mortals to comprehend. The shape in the water remains where it is. Probably because the presence of Cardin and the others makes it seem like I have friends who might defend me if I were attacked. I wait for Cardin's next move, watching him carefully. I hope I look defiant. He scrutinizes me for a long, awful moment. Think on us, he says to me. All through your long, sodden, shameful walk home, think on your answer. This is the least of what we can do. With that, he turns away from us, and after a moment, the others turn too. I watch him go. I watch them all go. When they're out of sight, I pull myself onto the bank, flopping onto my back in the mud next to where Taryn is standing. I take big, gulping breaths of air. The Nixies begin to surface, looking at us with hungry, opalescent eyes. They peer at us through a patch of fossils. One begins to crawl onto land. I throw my rock. 
It doesn't come close to hitting, but the splash startles them into not coming closer. Grunting, I force myself up to begin walking, and all through our walk home, while Taryn makes soft, sobbing noises, I think about how much I hate them, and how much I hate myself. And then, I don't think about anything but lifting my wet boots, one step after another, carrying me past the briars, and the fiddleheads, and the elms, past the bushes of red-lipped cherries, barberries, and damsons, past the wood sprites who nest in the rose bushes, home to a bath and a bed in a world that isn't mine and might never be.